is Alexandra Levy of the Atomic Heritage Foundation um, here in New Jersey on June 13th, 2016 with Joseph Papalia. My first question is to please say your name and spell it. Joseph Papalia, P-A-P-A-L-I-A. -A -A. Can you tell us where and when you were born? I was born August the 20th, 1936 in East Meadow, New York. So can you tell us a little briefly about your life and career and how you became involved in the 509th Composite Group? Uh, I uh, picked up on it when I, was a, when I was going to college. I was a history major in college. And I was always interested in looking into something that I thought would be very interesting historically and possibly something to be collecting in as well. So the more I thought about it, then I came to the conclusion that the atomic bombs and the guys who participated in that would be something that I would find very interesting. So I, I began to pursue that. And the first person I met who was part of that uh, 509 composite group, I met him initially over the phone, was Bob Caron, the tail gunner on the Enola Gay. Uh, he was selling pictures uh, to support the Confederate, which is now called the Commemorative Air Force. So I wrote him a letter and I asked to have a picture signed. And he wrote me back a letter saying to me, uh, I used to live in the town next to where you live in New York, which was Rockville Center. So from there we struck up a friendship and we did a lot of communicating on the phone. Uh, he also communicated by tape with me and then from him I got involved with other guys, primarily Fred Olivi, who was the second co-pilot on Boxcar. And then Fred, initially, after talking to him for a period of time, asked me if I would be interested in coming to one of the reunions. Now that was 1984. So I took him up on it and we went to the reunion in Philadelphia, where I met most of the guys who were on the plane, they were there, both on the uh, Nagasaki mission and the um, Hiroshima mission. And the more involved I became, the better I got to know these guys, and the more I got to know Fred. We did a lot of communicating, and then one day he asked me, he said, would you be interested in, in possibly considering uh, a title of historian of the 509th? So I said, yeah, I said, that's pretty good. So I jumped at it. So uh, from 84, I went to successive uh, uh, reunions right up until uh, last year at Wendover and meeting the guys, talking to the guys, knowing what they did and everything, it just got to be something great. And my wife came along with me, she became very interested in it too and that's how the, the whole thing evolved. I had written several articles pertaining to the 509th and uh, over the years I, I, I had a lot of stuff that I collected which I really truly enjoy looking at and that's basically how I got to where I am right now. So what, what was your what was your main career? Was it, this was just a side project? Uh, my main career uh, initially I was in the Air Force. I went in from uh, 55 to 58. I came out of the Air Force and I went into the landscaping business. Uh, I didn't have an education at the time. I went into the landscaping business and it, it eventually evolved into spraying and a tree service business. And by that time I had gotten married, my wife, who was a school teacher at the time, began to push me. She said, why don't you go take some courses? Because she knew of my interest in history. So I took a couple of courses at a community college and then that eventually involved into my, an associate's degree. And then I went to Queens College, New York, and I got a bachelor's degree with a history, uh, with a major in history and a minor in education. And I actually have a teaching certificate in history, nine through twelve. And then I completed my master's degree. Uh, at that time, in the seventies, they weren't hiring teachers; they were accessing teachers because of the budgets in, in my particular area. So then I decided, well, let me look into something else. So I also liked law enforcement. So I, I qualified to become a Nassau County, New York probation officer, which I was for 25 years. And then I retired in 2010.
and since then I've been just looking more at uh, the 509. Uh, I bought several antique cars which I work on and I, I go to antique car shows with it and that takes up a lot of my time. My wife and I, we travel a lot. We've been to quite a few places in Europe and all over the place. When I was in the Air Force, uh, I spent 18 months in Japan, and uh, I never got to Hiroshima, never got to Nagasaki. At that time, I really wasn't thinking about that. It was, you're young, you want to go out, you want to have a good time, and uh, uh, after that, uh, then when I came home, got married, and went through college, and, and got interested, uh, became interested in uh, the 509th, and that's when it all came to this point. Do you think your time in the Air Force contributed to your interest in the 509th? My time in the Air Force contributed, yes, to the 509th, but initially it contributed to my I loved aircraft. I was very interested in aircraft because I was, uh, like I said, in, in the Air Force. And uh, it did, and the members of the 509th were, were members of the uh, Army Air Force, as it was known back during World War II. So, I mean, it was like a, a sense of camaraderie there. Even though these guys preceded my enlistment by, by 10 years, I was in from 55 to 58. And yes, that did help. It did help. So just briefly, can you explain what the 509th Composite Group is and what exactly goes on with them today? Well, the reunions initially started, I believe it was sometime in the 60s, where they just had the reunions for the officers at that particular time. And then it slowly involved, uh, evolved into both officers and enlisted men. And they had these, these, these terrific reunions. Uh, they were having reunions before I even got involved. But I remember going to the 1984 reunion, and I was really uh, surprised at the number of guys that were there that were still active and the camaraderie that went on with these guys. And I, that's where I met Tibbetts. I met... Uh, Sweeney, and I met a, a Behan and a bunch of other guys who were on the plane, a, a Ferriby, and uh, some of the guys who were on Boxcar, I met them as well. And over the years, I met uh, Ashworth, Fre Frederick Ashworth, who was the weaponeer on uh, Boxcar, who was really a great guy. I mean, he was, he retired as a vice admiral in the Navy, and he was such an unpretentious man, you could talk to him. And he would listen to you and listen to you. And I was awed that this guy used... Now, I was an enlisted man in the service. I was at what they call an airman second class. And Ashworth retired as a vice admiral. And at the time he retired, he was the commander of the 6th Fleet in the Mediterranean. And I'm saying to myself, this guy is calling me and asking me on advice on the 5 on night. And it just, uh, just... I was just awed by it. And then I, I talked to guys, like I said, uh, Tom Ferriby... Uh, uh, Tibbets and many many other guys and they sharpened my interest in the 509. So the reunions have been really great as far as getting together every year and as a sense of camar <coughs> excuse me, camaraderie. Unfortunately today both of the, the uh, crew members are, are gone. The last one to die was, was Dutch Van Kirk and now we have uh, a number of who are still uh, alive, but they don't come to the reunions for various reasons because of age and other things. Uh, at the last reunion we at Wendover, we only had six guys from the 509th show up. So it has evolved from a mass membership uh, yearly of guys coming to now very few members of the 509th and mostly uh, sons, grandchildren, and relatives. So, um, what were your initial impressions of Colonel Tibbetts, Major Sweeney, when you went to the reunion and, and talk about how you got to know them a little bit better over the years? Really down-to-earth guys. I, I, uh, Tom Ferriby was very, very down-to-earth. So was Dutch Van Kirk. Tibbetts was, was pretty much so, but not, not so much as they were. I guess he still had that, that commander's instinct from being in the 509, but he was a nice guy to talk to. We went to lunch with him several times at the uh, at the Reading Air Show. Uh, as he got to be older, he uh, didn't want to sign as much material as he used to. And then he put the word out saying, I'm not signing anything anymore. So 
I had known him for years. I had spoken to him on the phone as well as talking to him at home. And so I said to myself, geez, I, I got this great thing here. I'm going to send it to him. So I sent it to him for an autograph. And about two weeks later, it came back. And he had scribbled a note and attached it to the, I think it was a picture. I don't sign autographs anymore. So <laughs> I said to myself, well, let me try a different attack on, a tactic on this. So I, I wrote back and I said, Colonel Tibbetts, I said, Joe Papalia, I said, do you remember me? We met at Reading and uh, at, at the reunions and so forth and so on. We had great conversations. We sat down, we had dinner with all the rest of the guys. So several weeks later, the picture comes back. It's all signed. And he said, with a note, okay, Joe, this time, but no more. <laughs> So, why do you think the stories of the 509 veterans are so important for the public today to understand? Well, I, I think to understand that, you've got to have a sense of history to begin with. You've got to know what they did. You've got to know what was going on during World War II. I think Dutch Van Kirk put it very nicely when he said, the Japanese of World War II are not the Japanese of today. I think Americans need to realize, and that instead of excoriating the dropping of the atomic bombs and taking these guys to task for what they did, which a lot of people do do, not everybody, but there are some people out there who do do this, I don't think those people really know their history. Uh, you, gotta, you have to understand what was going on in the world at the time, the, the atrocities that were being committed by the Japanese, the, the Code of Bushido, the Samurai Code, you know, death before dishonor. They, they were not going to give up. The Japanese were not going to give up. Uh, they had said they weren't going to give up. Uh, it was, it was uh, death to the last soldier. And the only thing that stopped them were the atomic bombs. Had it not been for the atomic bombs, we probably would have ended up invading Japan. The military didn't even tell the people about Hiroshima when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima because they didn't want the public to know about it. They kept it quiet as best they could. And then, you, of course, you had Nagasaki. At that time, then the emperor got himself involved, and he, gets, he said in so many words, enough is enough. He went to, uh, they had a, a, a meeting, and he told them that they had to endure the undurable. The, mil the military tried to have a revolt they wanted to get the recording that the emperor had made as far as uh, the, uh, co his capitulation to the Allies. So even up until that point, even after the, the uh, uh, emperor had spoken, they, was, they still wanted to fight. They had brought back like uh, most of the troops from uh, Manchuria. They had 5,000 kamikaze planes in reserve. They were, they were training the people to meet the soldiers on the beach. Uh, the women were, treat, were training with spears. Everybody had a role in stopping the invasion. The kamikaze planes, the role that the kamikaze planes were going to play in case of an invasion, they were going to crash into the landing barges, which would have been loaded with troops. So the atomic bomb, as horrific as it is, as it was, still was a necessary thing to do in order to bring that war to an end. If people don't realize just how fanatical the Japanese were, they should read a little bit about Okinawa and Iwo Jima and what it took to take those islands. How did the, um, the members of the 509th, especially Colonel Tibbetts and Major Sweeney and those who had led the bombing missions, feel about their legacy? Were they um, sensitive when people criticized them Never. for their role? I never, I never sensed any, uh, any sensitivity on their part, no. They were soldiers, they had a job to do, and they did it. They didn't question it. It was not their role to question it. They, they, I, I never heard one of them ever, ever complain or apologize as to the role that they played in the war. They, of course, they didn't, the, the, the killing of all of those civilians uh, is something that I'm sure that they've had a little bit of sympathy towards, but as far as what they did and how they did it, it never came into play as something, I shouldn't have done this. And what did they feel about the legacy of atomic weapons in the Cold War? I know some of them, like Colonel Tibbetts, continued on in the military after the war. They felt that the use of the atomic bombs demonstrated to the world 
the mass destruction that these weapons could create. And in so doing, in bringing the war to an end, the people could see what atomic bombs can do, and hopefully they would act as a deterrent for any future use of atomic bombs. Now, we have not had one single atomic bomb drop since World War II. So they have acted as a, as a terrific uh, deterrence against uh, uh, world conflagration, uh, I'm sorry, uh, destruction of the world. Uh, so uh, in that particular case, the atomic bombs have prevented mass world war. They have. Because uh, mutual uh, assured destruction means that I have bombs, you have bombs. If I use mine, you're going to use yours. So let's just step back and not do it. This has not, this has not stopped brush fires from happening and things like that, but it has prevented a massive world war. So did most of the 509s stay on in the military after the war, or did many No, their no. Uh, Colonel Tibbetts stayed on, Farabee stayed on, uh, Sweeney stayed in the reserves, O'Leary stayed in the reserves, uh, Commander Ashworth stayed in the Navy. He was a graduate of Annapolis. He stayed in. Parsons, a graduate of Annapolis, stayed in. Uh, to the be oh, and uh, Dusenberry stayed in. He was a flight engineer on the Enola Gay. He stayed in. Uh, I can't think of uh, anybody else who might have stayed in. Most of them wanted to get out. They wanted to get home. Colonel Tibbetts went on to have a very distinguished career. Is that correct? Uh, yes, he did, but there were some problems. Uh, Colonel Tibbetts was the commander of the 509th, and he had massive powers. All he had to do was mention the word silver plate, and he got what he wanted. Now, there were generals who resented him because of the authority and the power that he had. And after the war, some of these generals tried to keep him down a little bit. Now, he... He left, at the end of World War II, he was only a colonel. He, he reached the rank of colonel. When he retired, he retired as a brigadier general. Later on, because of the massive uh, feelings against the use of the atomic weapons and against Tibbetts, uh, he eventually uh, uh, decided it was time for him to leave the military. And there was some talk that because of all of that, he never got another star or another third star. And also, as I said before, there were people in the service who, who didn't like him. He, he could have an overbearing way sometimes, and they resented it. Uh, he had gone in, uh, to seek different things for the 509 supplies and so forth and so on. And when he had gone to certain military uh, people, uh, they had said, no, you're not getting it, you know, you're not getting it. And then he would pull the silver plate, and he got what he wanted. And they felt that, you know, who's this guy to come up to me? I'm a two-star or a three-star general. And you know how it is in the military, uh, they don't forget certain things. Just as a little bit of background, can you talk about the silver plate code name and also the modification of the B-29s? The silver plate was given to the, 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 uh, the 509th. It was, like a, it was the word that anybody who used that word usually had carte blanche as to what they could do. And that was what silver plate was. The planes themselves were called silver plate bombers. Why were they called that? Because the turrets were removed. The gun turrets, top and bottom, were removed. The reason for that was to make them faster and lighter because the bomb itself weighed about 10,000 pounds. So that was what the, uh, the reason for that. The modifi That was one modification. The other modification were the propellers. They had these reversible propellers, which let the plane stop faster. They would just literally reverse the propellers. So instead of sucking air, uh, uh, this way, it would be sucking air from the back, slowing the plane down. The bomb bays were widened to make room for the for the bomb, uh, for putting it in and for taking it out. Uh, other modifications, uh, I can't think of that uh, that come. But those were the basic modifications to the. There were 15 B-29s that were modified, and those were the the. the it was for uh, it was for speed and and for weight. The only armament they had was the tail gunner. He had a 50 caliber machine gun in the back. Yeah. It was, I believe, it was a double-barreled uh, 50 caliber in in the in the uh, uh, in the back of the plane.
that was where the tail gunner's position was. There was no other protection on the silver pl uh, plate plane. Um, when you say the, the atomic bombs were about 10,000 pounds. Approximately. Uh, how big were the payloads that B-29s typically carry? Now, if, uh, if I remember correctly, I think they had a payload of around 20,000 pounds. They carried 500-pound bombs, 100-pound bombs. They also carried incendiary bombs. That's how they set Tokyo on fire. It was in March of 1945. They destroyed almost 60, 70 percent of the city. Over 100,000 people in, in the March raid were, were incinerated. The, the heat that was coming up was so bad that some of the B-29s literally flipped over and came back. The guys in the, in the planes said that they could smell the stench of death that was coming up. They were flying in like about 10,000 feet. They brought the B-29 down from a height of 30,000 to 10,000 so that they could, they could get more precise bombing. And that night, uh, the incendiar incendiaries, incendiaries uh, really torched that city. More people were killed in Tokyo in that raid than were killed in Hiroshima initially. I know a lot of historians talk about how the atomic bombings in some way were just a continuation of the aerial bombings that were going on both in Germany and Japan during the war. Do you see that as, as an extension, the atomic bombings? Uh, I see the atomic bombing as something that was put together to end World War II. To me, it was something that was unique. Uh, as, as, as far as an extension was concerned, the bombings going on in Germany and the bombings going on in, in Hiroshima were similar because they, they were mass destruction. The atomic bomb, of course, was mass destruction, but it was something that was, in my mind, aside from the other bombs. It was a, a, a project that was not part of that. It was something that was put together solely to end the war. And the Japanese... Uh, a lot of people don't know this. The Japanese were working uh, on their own atomic bomb, as were the uh, the Germans. They were getting their, their heavy water out of Norway, and the Japanese were working to get their atomic bomb. And if anybody thinks that the Japanese would not have used the atomic bomb, uh, they don't know the history of Japan. Um, so to go back to Wendover, why did Colonel Tibbetts choose Wendover as the headquarters for the 509th? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, he wanted a place that was totally isolated. Because of the nature of their work, he wanted a place where they could be left alone, where people would not notice them, and they could do what they had to do to prepare for the use of the bombs. That place was so bad that uh, Bob Hope at one time gave a show there, and he called it Leftover. And it was, the, it was secrecy. It was secrecy on the part of Tibbetts and the part of what he was doing. They stayed there. They, the the uh, 509 composite group was activated in September of 1944. By May of 45, they were mostly on Tinian. They had flown to Tinian by. Uh, the, the bombers, of course, flew, and the guys who were part of the ground crew and everything else, they went over by boat. And... Uh, they stayed there until they dropped the bombs, and then they started coming back in November of 45. They came back to Roswell Air Force Base, where uh, many were discharged. And uh, the guys, one guy in particular who comes to mind, uh, Paul Metro, who was a 393rd radar operator, said after he got discharged, he literally uh, hitchhiked across the entire country here to New Jersey, where he lived. He lived in Edison, New Jersey. And uh, that was the story that he had given to me. So how many members were there of the 509? I believe there was something like, you know, I, I could be mistaken on this, I believe there was something like 1,800 members of the 509. Uh, Tibbetts had recruited them from various organizations out at Fairmont, Nebraska. Uh, and um, he recruited his... Uh, uh, navigator and his bombardier and other uh, members of his crew uh, personally too. Uh, Ferriby and Van Kirk had flown with him at, uh, uh, yes, had flown with him in England on, on the B-17 which was called the Red Gremlin. That was his B-17. And uh, 
then when he came back to the United States and he and he was and the 509th was put together, he called these guys and he uh, he called them in and said, uh, you know, I want you to come with me now. I don't know exactly where they were at that time, but they ended up in the 509th. That's the power that he had as the commander of the 509th. This guy could just about do anything, and if anybody questioned him, they had groves to answer to. And why was Tibbet selected as the head of the 509? Because he was he he was an, an ace pilot to begin with. The guy was just an ace pilot. His background was such that it lent uh, his leadership qualities were, were great. His flying powers were great, and uh, he was interviewed. He was interviewed uh, for the job in in one of his books. Of course, when they interview you, they know everything about you, and they're going to ask you questions to see if you're going to answer them truthfully. And they asked him, have you ever been arrested when he, during one of the interviews? And uh, Tibbetts said, yes, he said, I had gotten into trouble once. So they asked him, what happened? Well, he had gone out one night with a girl, and one thing led to another, and... Uh, the cops came and caught them in a compromising position, and they had to be, uh, it had to go to court or something. And he owned up to that. And they looked at it as being a test of his sincerity and honesty. And then Groves thought he was good. And uh, that's basically Spatz and the others, they all looked up to him. He had flown Dwight Eisenhower, I believe, and General Clark in Europe to various places where they were having meetings. He piloted these guys too. That's how much they thought of him. Um, so what is it like to visit Wendover today? What can tourists see and how have the sites been preserved? Well, it's, um, it's a lot of gambling casinos there. It's on the Utah Nevada border to begin with. Uh, a lot of them, World War II barracks, aren't there, they're gone. There's a, there, there's a monument there to the B-29. Uh, Jim Peterson, who's active in, in the preservation of Wendover Air Force Base, is trying his best to do as much as he can, and he has done a lot. Uh, they, they put up some World War II buildings, according to World War II structures. Uh, we had the meeting at, uh, I can't remember the name of the building, uh, but there are several buildings that they had built it's mostly in just a little area, but the areas outside of this where, where they practiced and where they had their, their billets and uh, buildings that ha uh, had ammunition are still somewhat preserved. But uh, as much as they keep putting up, there's still a lot there that's gone. Has the Enola Gay hangar been preserved? Yes, they're trying to take care of the Enola Gay hangar. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, it, it was a mess before they got to it. Uh, they've come a long way in keeping it. Uh, yes, they have uh, meetings in there, and they have, when they have shows, they have the people who go in there, and they sell artifacts and things like that. Have you ever been to Tinian? No, I've never been to Tinian. I've flown over once, but I've never been there <laughs> on my way to Japan. Are the bomb pits still there? The bomb pits are there. They're, they're, they're uh, glass enclosed with uh, signs that indicate what they are. So have you, you've been to Japan, have you ever been to Hiroshima and Nagasaki? No, I've never been. I've been close, but I, did, I never went. Because uh, I was in Japan 56 to, 57 to 58, and uh, I, I didn't, um, I was just a young kid then. I was 18, 19, 20 years old. You know, we, we were out, I was with a bunch of guys who, who, who drove motorcycles, and we just went all over the place, and we did the usual things that young guys do, and I really wasn't thinking about history in Japan at the time. So, you've done a terrific job collecting documents related to the 509. Can you talk about some of the most interesting and meaningful photographs and documents you've come across? Sure. I have, in Tibbetts' own handwriting, this was back when, when he was signing things. There was a time when, when Paul Tibbetts would sign anything that he considered to be relevant to, to the 509. Uh, and he never, he never was looking for compensation. He signed it and he sent it to you. I have one letter of him describing the dropping of the atomic bomb and what he saw as they circled around the mushroom cloud. The, 
the various colors down below, the, the, the fires and everything, so forth and so on, in his own handwriting. And he signed it, Paul W. Tibbetts, August 6, 1945, Hiroshima. I have uh, Behan, the bombardier, uh, on boxcar, in his own handwriting, it's like four pages, of him describing the beginning of the mission to the very end of the mission. And uh, he ends it by saying, you know, when I got back to Tinian, and I realized it was my birthday, we partied all night. <laughs> so I have that. I have a lot of things signed by uh, Frederick Ashworth pertaining to the bomb, pertaining to the mission. I have a lot of things by Bob Karen, uh, even some tapes that he gave me. Over, over a period of time, we communicated by tape. He wasn't really that much for writing. He preferred to talk by tape, and it's good because he, was, he, he would really talk, and uh, he would talk about a lot of things. And very, I, various pictures of uh, the, the aiming position signed by uh, Dutch Van Kirk with an arrow pointing to it, saying this is the aiming point of the atomic bomb where the Fermi released it. And uh, just many other things that, uh, those are basically the big ones. And of course, signed pictures of all the guys, the crews, the planes, uh, just a lot of things that um, from time to time I like to go and look at. Uh, you generously had donated your oral history collection to the Atomic Heritage Foundation for publication. How does it feel to, to listen to the stories of these men, many of whom have passed away? It, it's... It's a, first, of all, I have to, first of all, I have, to, I have to compliment the Atomic Heritage Foundation in putting these on their website because it makes, it makes people aware of history and what actually happened. Uh, listening to the voices, uh, it brings back memories uh, of um, the different things that uh, they did, the different things that they talk about. Uh, it, it just relives the history. It, 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 it makes it come alive again. When you hear these people talking about what they did and how they did it, and it just, it just makes me think about everything, and it just, it's just a great historical experience to listen to these people and their voices and how they carried on and what they did. Tibbetts has a, um, on your website, you have that one of Tibbetts with the video. That's a very good one, where he talks about everything. Uh, of course, Bob Karen and uh, uh, Fred O'Levy. And there's a few others, too, I, uh, that don't come to mind right now. But yes, it's if you want to relive history, you listen to the tapes. You're, you're listening to the actual voices of the people who were involved. What um, interesting artifacts have you collected? Oh, um, well, I have um, a lot of the things I, I got... Uh, I have a replica of the atomic bomb, which was signed by uh, uh, by Tibbetts and Van Kirk, I believe, if I remember correctly. Going going to the going to the meetings, uh, I picked up certain memorabilia which which was there. Uh, like I said, a lot of pictures they signed. Actual artifacts, per se, I don't really have as physical physical artifacts of of, of Tinian. Uh, what about replicas? I have here two, two, a replica of two plugs. Now, one is red and one is green. And there's a, there's a, a significance meeting, a meeting to that. When the Enola Gay took off, the atomic bomb was not armed. They didn't arm the atomic bomb at Tinian because they felt had it prematurely detonated, there would be no more Tinian. So... They come up with this idea of these of, of a safety plug and a hot plug. The safety plug was in the bomb when the plane took off. And the reason for that was is that the inside of this plug, elect electronically speaking, was such that the bomb could not make a connection. Once they put the 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 the, the bags of explosives it, inside the plane and they armed it and the bomb was ready to go. The green plug would come out, and the red plug would go in, which would tell everybody, it's armed, don't mess with it. And it's, that's how it flew all the way to Hiroshima until they dropped it. The plugs were initially owned by Morris Jepson. Morris Jepson then put them out for auction. 
And a fellow by the name of Clay Perkins was the successful bidder. And the value of the plugs at the time of the auction was $150,000. And he, to this day, has them. I remember he came to one of the reunions. It was the New Orleans reunion. He came with the plugs. And uh, he took them out and he handed them to me. And he put them into my hand and he said, Joe, you got $150,000 in your hand. <laughs> and I said, yeah, wow. <laughs> so that was, uh, the reason I mentioned that is because it's the value placed on some of the things regarding uh, uh, those uh, uh, people who were involved with the atomic bomb. And to this day, a lot of pictures and artifacts still go for a lot of money, a lot of money. There is a lot of it out there today. Uh, the ones that are really the most sought after, the ones that are the most unique. There are certain things that are very unique, and these would be classified as unique. Are there many B-29 silver plates that haven't survived, or have all those been lost? Uh, out of the original 15 B-29s, the... Two that I'm aware of is Boxcar, which is the, at, at the Wright-Patterson Museum, and uh, the Enola Gay, which of course is at the Washington D. Was it um, Hazy? I forget the name of it. The Udver Hazy. Yeah, it's at something. it's at that museum. The Enola Gay is is there. They put the whole thing together, and I remember when they were doing it, there was a lot of controversy involved, and a lot of people uh, who were pacifist groups who felt that that plane should not be honored because what it done. What it had done. Were you involved at all at the, in the debate over the exhi exhibition on the Enola Gay at the Smithsonian in 1995? And how did the 509th veterans feel about it at the time? Well, the, they were very upset about it. The, 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 the veterans felt that they were getting a raw deal. They felt that they had contributed something to ending, end World War II. And because of what they did, they were being um, excoriated, and they just didn't think that was the right thing to do. And eventually, Tibbetts got into it, and a lot of other people got into it. I had written some letters, things like that. Uh, and eventually, they prevailed. And as you know, the, the Anoli Gay now is on display in, in Washington, D.C. They wanted the, the, the Anoli Gay to be displayed in the museum. Uh, and they felt that they had the right to have it displayed because the plane itself had, had done something to help the end of the war, although it took a second atomic bomb to drop. Now, that plane, for many years, sat in a museum in, in Maryland, in Suitland, Maryland. It sat in a museum. And I remember going there, and uh, at, when I got there, I mean, back then, people were, were very much laid back. This was like in the 80s. And I went in there and I spoke to somebody and I said, look, I got a camera. Can I go up and take a picture of the Enola Gay? And the fuselage was here, the tail was there, the wings were there, it was all in pieces. And the guy said, yeah, he said, go ahead. So I literally walked up to the plane, I walked through it, I took pictures up in the, up in the fuselage. I still have these pictures today. And then eventually they, they, they restored it from there and they took it and they, they uh, trucked it into Washington and then they were at rest today at the museum. And so the controversy at the time was that some of the pacifist groups were against showing it? And well, the, the, not only were there pacifist groups, there were, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe there were people in Japan as well, uh, and there were people who were, I'm sure they were well-intentioned, people who just were against war, and they just felt that, it, to them, it was a symbol of war, and they just felt that it shouldn't be placed up on a pedestal. So it wasn't just, you know... Uh, passive, uh, uh, you know, resistive groups. It was just, it was a combination of people. But then again, the guys who wanted it pushed back, and eventually it got restored. I think of it, I think they, they, they just showed the fuselage to begin with. And then eventually they put the whole thing together and where it sits. It's a very beautiful plane to go look at. Do you know if any of the veterans have been to see the restored Enola Gay or boxcar? Oh, yes. Uh, we've had reunions. Uh, both uh, to uh, um, Wright Patterson and to the museum in D.C. Uh, we went there. Uh, they had a special showing for us. Uh, normally, people can't go under the plane. They can't go near the plane. You, they keep you back by. They have uh, borders around it where you're not supposed to cross. And when we went there, they let us walk into the plane. Now, when I say us, myself and the um, 
and the, and, and the guys from the reunion. I'm, I'm not a member of the 509th. I just, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm a historian. And uh, we walked under the plane. We looked up into the plane. We got right up to the plane. And I, I remember looking around, and there were these guys in uniforms watching us. <laughs> And I'm sure that they were guards for the museum. They wanted to make sure that nothing happened to the plane. But they let us walk all around the plane, look up into the plane, and uh, they were very nice to us. They were very nice. And at Wright-Patterson, they let us do the same thing. Although I think one year they wouldn't let us go near it. But then at, uh, another year we walked under a boxcar. So, to the best of my mind, those are the only two silver plates. A lot of them, after the war, ended up in crashes and uh, on the scrap heap. How did the veterans feel seeing an Ole Gay and Boxcar oh, again? They, they were moved by it. I mean, they're, they're very proud. They're, they're very proud. Uh, uh, just the fact that they come to the reunion and they look at the planes and everything, I mean, that tells you something. They, a lot of them travel hundreds, thousands of miles just to come to the reunions. And like I said, over a period of time, the ranks were uh, thinned out because of what was going on, you know, uh, health-wise and age-wise and everything. Uh, yes, they were a very proud uh, bunch of guys. There were some guys who never came to the reunion, and there were some guys who felt uh, they, they really didn't care. But uh, that's their prerogative. Now, when you said there were about 1,800 who were in the 509. Yeah, maybe more were, or less. I'm, I'm not sure the exact number. Were all of those on Tinian as well, or were those at one, were they, did all of them move from Wendover to Tinian? Most of them moved from, from west over to Tinian. Now, I believe that some of them stayed uh, at Wendover, but I can't, I can't think of the exact number who might have stayed. Now, I could be mistaken on this. I'm not sure. But I know that the, uh, the, silver, uh, the uh, silver plate bombers were worked on at Wendover even after uh, I think they had gone. I think they had come back for the, um, uh, for the bomb bay doors. But I believe there was some that was still there, but then again, I can't be sure. Do you know anything about Colonel Clifford Heflin, who sure. was the... He was the base commander the base of the commander West commander at Wendover, yeah. so he wasn't he, They They, they called him the second Tibbets. The second Tibbets. Yes, they called him the second Tibbets, and they feel that uh, he did not get the recognition that he should have gotten. The 509th members feel yeah. that. Yeah, they called him the second Tibbets. Uh, he did a lot, I believe, with the planes, getting the planes ready, so forth and so on. And so they, so they respected him. Oh, yes, yes. He was highly respected as the base commander. Um, and so soon after the bombings, two of the planes went back to the U.S. in case they needed to collect the third bomb? Did they go to Wendover? Do you know? As far as I know, they got to California. And when they got to California, the word went out to them, don't come back. The war is over. So they uh, stayed in California? As, I, I don't know where they went from California. Chances are they probably went to Roswell. You know, Or, or they could have gone to Wendover and then from there to, uh, to uh, Roswell Air Force Base. Um, what goes on at these reunions? Is it just mostly conversation? Are there air shows? We've had flyovers for the guys. Uh, the B-2 bomber has flown for us. As a matter of fact, it flew at Wendover at the last reunion we had. Uh, the speaker at the last reunion was uh, Colonel Paul Tibbets the uh, fourth, a brigadier general. He's in charge of the 509th bomb wing at uh, uh, Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. He was there. He was the main speaker. Uh, we've had uh, flyovers at other bases from other, uh, I mean, uh, I was impressed uh, the, at the Los Alamos reunion when we, we went to Los Alamos from uh, Albuquerque. And as we were uh, traveling in buses at that time, they, they had to rent three or four buses because of the number of guys that came. The, the, the side of the road was lined with Boy Scouts, and as the buses passed, they were saluting. Uh, there's camaraderie, uh, there's places to go and see. Uh, we have uh, a banquet where uh, everybody goes uh, at, at Saturday night because the last day is Sunday where we just have a business meeting for the next reunion. And uh, we have a guest speaker. And uh, then there's their free hours and so forth. It's just a great get-together with things to do, places to go. 
And the last night being Saturday is uh, the banquet night, and the next day is the uh, business meeting. Where are we going next year? And then at one year, I know that they were talking about just discontinuing the reunions, but they were overruled. Where is it going to be this year? It's going to be in, uh, I believe it's San Antonio, Texas. Thank you. <laughs> so will you be going to that one? Yes. So that's something you look forward to every year? Yeah, we're going to go. Uh, it initially started out as not a, 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 an official reunion. It was just going to be a get-together of people from previous reunions. And then they changed it around. Uh, so it's going to be at San Antonio. From uh, what I've been reading in the newsletters, we're going to be going to places like uh, the Nimitz Museum. Admiral Nimitz, who was in charge of the Navy in the Pacific during World War II. Uh, the Alamo. Uh, and a few other museums that uh, don't come to mind right now. Do the other 509th historians, Bob Krause and John Coster Mullen, also attend the reunions? Yes. Uh, B B Bob Krause is the, is the chairman of the reunions. He's, he's been the chairman since the, the 90s. Uh, Coster Mullen came to the last reunion. He's been coming to the reunion. Yes, John Custer Mullen comes and he always brings artifacts and pieces of uh, atomic bombs with him. He's very much into that. He is uh, a very knowledgeable man. Knows a lot. He really does. Uh, he's been into this uh, for 20 years. I remember the, f more than 20 years, uh, I remember the first time I met him. It was Al uh, Albuquerque. He had just written his book and uh, he was, nobody knew him. And he was standing off to the side. So I saw, as I walked by, I saw he was standing there with, with some books. So I went up to him and I st struck up a conversation with John. And, you know, I asked him about the book and so forth. He said, yeah, I just wrote the book. Um, and uh, he, attended, um, he attended the reunion before in Chicago, but I didn't meet him here. I met him at the, the, the following year. So I bought the book and he went around introducing himself. Ashworth read the book. And Ashworth, he, he critiqued the book, and he told John, he said, John, he said, no, he said, Ted, you got this stuff all wrong. So John went back to the drawing board, and he put it all back together again. And now today his book is sought after by actually foreign countries, diplomats, and things like that, because it's considered the, the book on the bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm talking about the mechanical and the electrical aspects of the bomb and how it functions. Uh, he's the guy who... He's interviewed all over the place. He's given a talk at the University of Chicago. Uh, I don't know if he's spoken at the Atomic Heritage Foundation. I know he was there the last time. Uh, but John has been all over the place. From time to time, you'll pick up articles of him in the New York Times. Very knowledgeable. Um, he's a pretty nice guy. So it seems like you all have slightly different interests as, yes. as the historians. Yes. Bob is uh, more into the photograph end of it. Bob has written a book, too, The 509th Remembered which is an excellent book as well. Very good book. Detailed about the 509th. Very good. And um, what have you published? I, I, I have written articles. I haven't published anything. I've written articles, several articles pertaining to the bomb and the use of the bomb. I haven't gotten into it. Uh, I, I wanted to devote my time more to meeting the guys and, and talking to them. I didn't want to get locked up in writing a book and spend a year. I mean, like it took me a year to do my thesis, uh, when I, my master's degree, which I did uh, on the, uh, it was called the Evolution of American Strategic Doctrine. That took me a year, and I just didn't feel like spending a year writing a book. And besides, so many books have been written, I figured, what, can, what more can I add to it? You're more interested in the human stories. Yes, and, and the collecting and so forth and so on. And um, uh, the books, I, I, I prefer to read them than write them. How many documents and photographs do you think you've collected? I, 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 I haven't. It's impossible for me to give count. Uh, I would say it's in the hundreds, maybe more. Maybe more. Do you still get people who write to you and say, I found this great photograph, are you interested? No, not so much anymore. Not so, it's, been, it's been a number of years. A lot of people haven't um, uh, been as interested as they were in the past, only because of generational changes, and that's it. Now, I know in your collection there was a, a bunch of letters from Paul Filipowski. Yes. Who was he? Uh, Paul Filipowski was a... <clears throat> he lived in Florida. Gainesville, Florida. He was a mailman. And I got him involved in the 509th. He initially uh, 
started out with collecting Manhattan Project uh, memorabilia. He had a, a tremendous amount, and I know he donated a number of it to the Smithsonian uh, after his death. <clears throat> and uh, I have letters from him pertaining to certain things. Uh, nothing really historical, just conversations back and forth of people he wrote, people he spoke to, and things he's collected. He had a lot of badges. Uh, I have copies of of his letters. I have his his uh, his mother had sent me everything he ever collected, and I put it together for her and sent them back to her. Uh, he was very much involved in, in, the, in the Manhattan Project collecting. Uh, he was a good guy. Unfortunately, he died prematurely. And like I said, his stuff was 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 donated to the. Not all of it. Some of it went on the auction block. Uh, but he donated a lot to the Smithsonian from there. I don't know where it went. But he was in contact with many, many, many scientists and physicists involved with the Manhattan Project. Uh, and I have copies of many of those letters. Copies. I had them all in front of me, uh, and I'm looking at them, and I'm going, wow, <laughs> now they got to go back. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on the new Manhattan Project National Historical Park and how this history should be presented. I think it's a great thing that the Atomic Heritage Foundation is doing. I think it's a preservation of history. Uh, I, I think it's good for generations to come. I think it should be balanced between uh, the Manhattan Project and World War, uh, World War II and the reasons why the Manhattan Project came in. Uh, and I think that people can't judge it by today's standards looking back. Uh, it, 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 it's a preservation of history, and I know there are people who, who, who criticize it, but you can't criticize it by today's standards. You've got to go back into history and read history to understand what it's all about. It's great. Uh, it's a place for great research. It's a preservation, again, as I said, of American history, and I think you're doing a great job. And uh, as long as it's balanced, uh, I, I don't think that people should take the, the feeling that, oh, it was terrible, it was terrible. It was, no, it wasn't terrible. What was terrible was what was happening in the world during the war, a World War of 1945. It was a means to an end. That's what it was. And it served the end rightfully. And, it, and, and, and the manufacturing of the atomic bomb through the Manhattan Project, uh, it, it, it saved more lives than it took more lives. Had we invaded, it would have been, it would have been horrific. Yes, you people are doing a good job, and you, and I, I look at your website all the time. So, um, what else would you say about the legacy of the Manhattan Project in the world today? It spawned so many different things, from nuclear weapons to nas the national laboratories. Um, the, the Manhattan Project, out of the Manhattan Project came a lot of medical discoveries, and it served the people well. Uh, a lot of things that the, that these scientists had been looking into and making later on uh, became uh, medical uh, uh, great things, great things medically for, for, the, for the population of the world. Uh, how is it serving? Uh, it's, I don't know what other words I can put this into. It, um, it's just, just keep up the good work. It's just doing a great job, and you, as long as you keep in front of the people and you present it fair and square and explain to them what it is, what it's all about, as you have been doing, the preservation of these sites, for historical sites for the people, I think is a great idea. It's a great idea, and you did a great job. You're doing a great job. Do you um, have any other funny stories or moving stories that you'd like to share about your work with the 509th and the veterans? No, I've had some good... I've, I've had some good times with them. I had some funny times with them, too. Uh, I had heard this one story where Bob Lewis had, had stolen a plane to come to a... Uh, uh, he was the, the co-pilot on the Enola Gay to come to New York City to attend a wedding. He, he took a plane. He landed at Mitchell Field, which is not too far from where I live. And he went to a wedding, and he went back, and he got called in, and he really got ranked out, and, and Tibbetts really chewed him up one side and down the other. Uh, by stealing, I mean he took it. He wasn't authorized. 
And the only thing that saved him from Tibbets really going after him was because he was such a great uh, pilot, and Tibbets wanted to keep him. And that was during the war? That was during the war. I, I've read that they Tibbets would send people who talked when they shouldn't have about yeah. what was going yes, on to yeah. Alaska. Yes. And there were a few people who got sent to Alaska. Yes, there were. From what I understand, yes, there were people. One was a lieutenant colonel, if my memory serves me. Wow. So are there any other, any other things you'd like to uh, share? No, I, I think that's it. I just want to end it by saying that the 509th was a great outfit. Uh, not the only great outfit in World War II, but they, were, they did their fair share of bringing the war to an end, like all the other guys who fought in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, I think Groves had a good idea when he, when, when he decided to do it. Though I think Groves had to be reined in a little bit, which he was. Uh, the one story that I, I, I like is the one where Groves wanted to bomb Kyoto. And Secretary of War Stimson stepped in and said, no, you're not touching Kyoto. You know, it's a cultural center and we need to keep that intact. He said, if we destroy that, we are destroying their cultural heritage and they'll, they'll hate us forever. So Groves took it off the list. And uh, not, uh, Groves was made by Stimson, uh, Stimson to take it off. But Groves still tried to push it a little bit more, even though it was taken off. But uh, Stimson uh, said no. <laughs>